It's a vote that divided the nation and raised questions about the legitimacy of the current government in Honduras, most recently illustrated by these policemen on strike. Our people are sovereign and we owe them. Therefore, we cannot confront and refuse their rights. A closely contested election last month delivered a disputed result. The US-backed incumbent, President Juan Orlando Hernandez of the ruling National Party, appeared to be trailing his main rival, the former TV star Salvador Nasrallah, as results rolled in. But the Supreme Election Tribunal suspended the ballot counting for more than 24 hours without giving a reason. When it resumed, Hernandez had pushed into the lead and was quick to claim victory, something categorically rejected by Nasrallah. Here you have the president-elect that the people want, the people choose, the people decided. Nobody can silence the people. Thousands of Hondurans agreed with him and poured into the streets in protest. In response, the government suspended fundamental rights and deployed security forces to enforce a curfew as fighting continued with demonstrators. It's the country's worst political crisis since the 2009 coup, and for the moment, neither side appears willing to back down. President Hernandez looks set to secure a second term before polling began. He's enjoyed a relatively popular first term after fulfilling electoral promises to crack down on crime and the drug trade. But recent accusations of corruption and embezzlement of state funds and the rise of the leftist candidate Nasrallah marked the beginning of his decline. Hernandez has now said he's open to the opposition's demand for a complete recount, something international observers have reiterated. To generate the conditions so that all parties involved can have the necessary conditions and guarantees to transparency. Also, the flexibility that this is guaranteed that the process will not be over until it is over. But the fact that the Supreme Election Tribunal is headed by a member of the President's party means its final decision will remain disputed. As public opinion continues to turn against Hernandez and the opposition continues to claim victory, will he step aside? Or will there be more violence as the standoff continues? Shoaib Hassan, the newsmakers. Well, joining me now from the Honduran capital, Tegucigalpa, is Gina Kawas. She's the Corporate Relations Director at the Foundation for Education in Honduras, a charity that focuses on education and development. In New York, we have Victoria Gaitan. She's the Program Manager for the Global Americans, a human rights think tank. And in London, Latin America analyst Javier Farge. I thank you all for joining us on the program. Let me begin by asking you all the same question. I'm going to start with you, Gina. Were those elections rigged to favor the president? I am based in Tegucigalpa right now, um, where there is a palpable tension in the air, to say the least. There is substantial evidence to claim that there was vote rigging, not only by the opposition alliance, who is the victim in this case, um, being robbed um, of an election, but also the Organization of American States and the European Union, right. who had an electoral um, observation mission in Honduras that uh, has been in the country for over two months. Okay. They have um, presented and published uh, in forums uh, claiming that there is evidence of irregularities um, that can lead to believe that there was vote manipulation by the Electoral Commission in Honduras who is high, that, that is highly politicized and whose president is part of the national party, the, the party of the incumbent right. candidate. Okay. So, 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 Gina, let's, let me just pause you there for a second before you expand on that, right? So, Javier, do you agree with Gina and the OAS that there were so many irregularities? Do you then take that leap and believe that it was rigged? Well, it seems to me that based on the information we have available at the moment, that seems to be the case. When 50% of the votes had been counted, Mr. Nasraya, the opposition, Salvador Nasraya, the opposition uh, candidate, was ahead by five points. The trend remained by five points ahead for him. Suddenly, there's a break in the system, four hours break, then suddenly you have 
uh, you know, the, the electoral tribunal admits that the database had been reformatted, they had to start from scratch, and suddenly Mr. Hernandez, the incumbent, becomes favorite and wins the election. By the 23rd, by, by, this, by uh, Wednesday, 71% uh, of the vote had been voted, and Mr. Nasraya led by 100,000 votes. So right. it doesn't seem to me like, like, like a technical problem to me, okay. and I have the feeling, and even the Jesuits, are, the yeah. Jesuits in Central America say that this is actually fraud, and the Electoral right. Tribunal is responsible for this situation. Okay, so Victoria, are you convinced that there was fraud, that the opposition leader, Nasrallah, was winning, and then the government just cut the cord on the elections? That seems to be a narrative the opposition believes. What do you believe? Based on the evolution of events during the past week and what have my colleagues mentioned, um, it appears that the election was full of irregularities. Last Monday, um, Juan, Juan Orlando Hernandez was pronounced with a favor, a favor of 43 percent of the vote, uh, counting almost 100 percent of the ballots. But let's recall that this happened after a long week of slow voting and after a supposed failure in the computing system. So it appears the process was full of irregularities, and this has sparked, obviously, fury among the population fury and mistrust that has not been built just by this past week, but back from 2009, building up through a series of corruption right. allegations, irregularities, mistrust in political institutions, mm -hmm. etc. So all these factors put together, well, they generate the political crisis that Honduras is going through today. Right. And I think you're all in agreement that this has been a long time coming. Gina, you're on the ground. First of all, give us a sample of what the atmosphere is like in Tegucigalpa. Like, is it, is it really tense and are you fearful that things could spiral out of control? And what does it mean that the police are refusing to follow the orders of implementing a state of emergency? What exactly does that mean and how dangerous is that? Um, a curfew was imposed last Friday after protests. Like Victoria said, there's been a series of protests that started two days after the election. Um, some have turned violent, unfortunately, because the tribunal or the Electoral Commission has not yet proclaimed an official winner. And the results that they have published are highly contested. So people have just poured out into the streets and marched um, since this turned like into riots and looting. Um, the government imposed a curfew last Friday, uh, so we cannot leave our homes um, from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. for 10 days. This expires on November 11th. During the curfew, people uh, did not respect it, and they still uh, went out to manifest at night. Um, some of us did it in our homes with banging pots and pans, um, called a cacerolazo, which is one of the most popular um, forms of protest when there's a curfew installed. But people, some people decided not to follow through with the curfew and went out on the streets, and the military um, have repressed or suppressed them. There's um, up to this day, I think, three persons killed. That's the official data I have. Some news outlets have um, have published, published or reported that it's six, six dead people. But last uh, Monday, two days ago, the police forces announced, and I think this is a watershed moment, that they would not follow through with the gov government orders to suppress the population. And they went to their quarters um, and said they would not come out until the crisis was resolved. Then the government came out saying that this was a strike because they were demanding better wages, something that was completely dismissed by the head of the police. And they came to a negotiation and now they are back in the streets uh, guarding, but they maintain firm that they will not repress or suppress the population. Right. Victoria, how different are the two men politically, ideologically? when it comes to Hernandez and Nasrallah? Are they fighting for, for two different visions of what the future might be for Honduras? Um, well, uh, we have Nasrallah with a um, more leaning towards the left agenda, and we have Juan Orlandez, which we can say is um, the status quo, correct? Now, the important thing to focus here is on the demands of the population and the representation of the free will of the population. What is happening in Honduras, it's a country highly hit by violence, by insecurity, by inequality, and that has generated um, political mistrust and an increasing unsatisfaction of the citizens. So all this piled up together, they are not um, 
they are they want the manifestation of the free will and 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 their democratic demands so um it's a matter of ensure one ensuring a democratically elected leader who is willing to put forward the demands and the agenda of the people and we've had manuel zelaya the former president and the leader of the opposition alliance javier saying he wants a full recount do you agree with him is that the only way to go forward but it's the only way, but with international observers, which is something that Mr. Zelaya has already said it should happen, and the president, the incumbent, Mr. Hernandez, has accepted that there should be a recount. The problem we have at the moment is that if the database was wiped out or was reformatted, then they, it will not reflect the original result that we were getting in, in Honduras after the, the Sunday election, which gave Nasraya 5% lead. If there is a reform, if, if a, it will have to be some kind of independent verification of this process to make it credible because, as I said, if there's been a reformatting of this database, it's very likely that it would have been manipulated and it, it, that needs to be corrected properly. So that is the problem we have at the moment, that whether any kind of recount under the current circumstances will, have, will reflect the will of the people, which is what we saw. We mustn't forget that in Latin America, indeed in other parts of the world, but in Latin America, and we have had elections recently, the trend when you get to 50 to 60 percent of the votes counted, the trend of 5 or 4 percent for the candidate tends to reflect the final outcome. In this mm -hmm. particular case, that completely disappeared because of this situation of the database. So there will have to be some kind of independent international verification to make any kind of recount uh, 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 credible. Right. Gina, a lot of anger in the past week, a lot of people feeling they've been hard done by, a lot of people losing faith in the institutions. Would, if there was a recount, would people consider changing their minds and, and voting for the other candidate, a candidate different to the one they chose in the first round, given the events of the past few days? I believe that Nasrallah would definitely win. Um, as you say, there is the lack of trust and credibility that not only the Electoral Commission as an institution has, but the whole government as a whole, all of the government institutions, and including the Supreme Court, um, are just completely um, off. And if there was a recount, like Javier said, I think, uh, and even the opposition has said this, um, they have their own tally sheets uh, because they received a copy of them after the, the election happened, after the ballots were closed, they say that their own tally sheets, and this is the Alliance of Opposition along with the Liberal Party, which came in third in this election, they're claiming that their tally sheets reflect something different than the ones that are in the power of the Electoral Commission. So if there is a vote recount and these two are compared, it is likely that because the Electoral Tribunal um, manipulated or, or did something to this original um, ballots and vote, the voting tally sheets, um, they will not match, and probably the result will continue as it is reflected now, uh, which gives the lead to, to Hernandez. So the solution that would leave people uh, feeling peace and feeling that their, their vote was actually um, counted and that, and that it is being respected is that a runoff happens and that people vote again because there's been such manipulation that the results in the power of the, of the tribunal, of the electoral commission, are just not, not trusting anymore. People right. don't, don't believe in them. Javier, if regional powers particularly the United States, want to get involved and help, would that be a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, Daniel Rundi, who is a well-known Republican conservative commentator in the US, has said, said in the Foreign Affairs magazine that the, the United States has a lot to lose if Nasraya wins the election because they have invested, quote-unquote, millions of dollars to prop up the government of Mr. Hernandez. It's not, in, it's, it's not in the interest of, uh, and according to this analyst, uh, by, by Nasraya winning, the U.S. will not have a strong allies in Central America, which is, as we know, an, a very important strategic part of Latin America for the United States. So it's not in the interest of, of the United States to allow anyone but Mr. Hernandez or a conservative president to win. I'm not suggesting for the minute that they have been involved 
actively any kind of fraud, because we don't have any evidence of that. But it is symptomatic that the conservative elements in the intelligentsia in the United States say that we cannot, they basically are saying that we cannot afford to lose Honduras to a center-left uh, government. So yes, there's a lot of interest. And at the same time, it's important to emphasize that since the 2009 coup against President Zelaya, there's been an increasing uh, process of militarization of the Honduran society. Mm -hmm. The army have been given a great deal of power. And even if an opposition candidate wins, it remains to be seen how the army, which has a lot of power these days, would react uh, uh, you know, with a completely different uh, non-conservative uh, president in Honduras. So we have a lot, of, a lot at stake in Honduras at the moment. Right. So, Victoria, those, particularly on the opposition side, do they have a right or just cause to be suspicious of Washington and any of its intentions if it wants to get involved, given that Washington is widely believed by many to have given the coup regime a bit of a nudge in getting Manuel Zelaya kicked out in 2009. Are they right to be suspicious of Washington's interests and intentions? Well, um, Hernandez, President Hernandez is very close to Washington. He made a recent trip. But we must also remember that the U.S. has been a long supporter. It's the largest bilateral donor of Honduras through foreign aid, to the, through the U.S. Uh, strategy for Central America. And it has built a very healthy relationship with the country in order to procure a joint security agenda, not only in Honduras, but the seven Central American states and obviously expanding into Mexico. Um, so it, it's, it's, I'm, I remain an optimist. It is my belief that uh, the U.S.'s priority is to maintain healthy relations, and it's going to focus in the democratic election of a leader. Um, actually, the embassy issued a statement recently um, that supporting supporting uh, the electoral process, supporting international election observation missions, and even condemning violence. So we can expect a U.S. Uh, position of con in the short term to continue to monitor closely the process and in the long term as an ally to continue building this joint agenda. Gina, are the Americans going to help or harm the situation? Well, they have been involved. The, like um, Victoria said, they issued uh, a statement saying that it was kind of ambiguous because, like, like the U.S. has very um, is very known to to submit and, and publish ambiguous um, statements. They said that they do condemn violence and that they are backing the informs of the electoral observation missions. But they also said that they support the how the electoral um, commission has. Um, has followed through with all this process. So it's kind of a contradiction. Um, I believe that the United States needs to remain a partial arbiter, and there is clear inclination towards Hernandez. Like my colleagues have said, there they have invested millions and billions of dollars in security aid and military aid for Honduras. Um, Hernandez is clearly their man, and um, a win for Salvador Nasralla would mean a complete shift um, in Honduras, uh, meaning that the security um, policies would change, et cetera, as well as social policies. So I do believe um, Washington is a bit inclined towards Hernandez, but they definitely need to remain uh, a very uh, impartial arbiter to resolve the situation. Victoria, given that you all agreed that this has been a long time coming, what is the fundamental thing that needs to change to ensure that this doesn't boil over, because clearly this could have been the straw that broke the camel's back this election. So what needs to be reformed fundamentally in Honduran society? Well, the first thing that needs to happen is that the electoral board in Honduras needs to ensure that the free will of the people stands as the ultimate outcome through a peaceful process and legitimate elections. And in this matter, the role of international organisms and observers such as the OAS, the European Union, etc., is crucial to work as honest brokers. Um, after the events of this week, the, the tension, the violence, and the pressure by, by these international observers has helped to produce two things. One is a strike of the police, not willing, re re retreating, and not willing to keep uh, these confrontations with the people. And the other one is the announcement that we saw recently about the partial recount. The electoral board has, has agreed for a partial recount of almost 5,000, a little bit over 5,000 of, um, of the polling places, almost 30 percent of all voting sites. The opposition has demanded for a total recount and even um, 
legislation for a runoff if necessary. Now, we'll have to see how the situation evolves in the coming weeks because right. a runoff, as you know, is not legislated by the Constitution. But um, what needs to happen in the short term is the insurance uh, that the free will of the people will be the ultimate outcome. And as I said, international observers are crucial in this process. Final, final question to Javier. In 20 seconds, please, Javier, because I'm out of time. How's this going to turn out? I think I'm, I'm as optimistic as Victoria. I think the president has given in in terms of allowing the recount of votes. The will of the people have to be respected, as Victoria and Gina had said. There have to be a process of demilitarization of the, of the Honduran society and a strong commitment by any government to fight corruption and to fight, uh, you know, the cr crime, which is a big problem in Honduras. If that happens, then Honduras can go back to a state of normality that they so desperately need under these current violent circumstances. Mm -hmm. That's okay. the only way things can actually work out. OK, Javier Farge, Gina Kawas and Victoria Gaitan. It's been good talking to all of you to get a bit of deeper insight into the situation in Honduras. Thank you very much for joining us here on the Newsmakers.